Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for another Sherpa Funds Technology Process Alpha webinar. Uh, my name is Stephen Quimby, in charge of sales and marketing here at Sherpa, and I'm joined by our CEO and founder, Richard Waddington. Um, I'd like to thank everybody again. We have people registered from South America, is new to the webinar series this time. Um, this is quite the time and quite the commitment to be registered for a webinar uh, in Brazil at just after midnight. So so thanks so much for, for registering and, and taking the time to join us tonight. Um, as usual, you know, everybody, we are going to be going through a topic fairly quickly today. So I'd like to kind of set the ground rules. Know that we are going to be doing questions at the end. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat at the side. We also will be recording this session. So if you have to jump out midway through and you miss a part of the session, or if you join us a little tools that we use it. Richard? Oh. Stephen, we've lost you. Stephen, hello? Sorry, no, we just lost you there for a second. So maybe just uh -oh. go the last 10 seconds again. Ah, sorry. So um, today, this is the third of our Sherpa Funds Technology, How Good Is Your Portfolio webinar series. So this is a series covering tools that we use at Sherpa Funds Technology to help PMs understand their portfolio composition better, to understand whether they've built a well-constructed portfolio and then to understand how that portfolio's performance uh, is playing out relative to other potential outcomes. So today we're gonna put together the pieces from our first two webinars. So we're gonna review first briefly, for those of you who weren't able to make the first two sessions, our compliant candidate portfolio analysis, as well as our risk quality graphs. Then we're going to talk about how we can look at our risk preference before we see the results of the portfolio to determine how varying levels of risk or varying risk preferences impact the actual results that we see in the portfolio outcomes. And then we're going to tie that back together to see how both of these tools can fit together so that we can pinpoint how much risk we want to take and make sure that we're building well-constructed portfolios to take the risk we want to take in the best possible manner. Um, and as I said, we will be taking questions at the end. So if you have questions, feel free to hold on to them uh, till the end or to get them into the chat at the side of the webinar panel. Um, if it's particularly relevant, we'll, we'll try to tackle it midway through the midway through the stream. So, so Richard, give us a give us a little bit of a glimpse. What are we talking about today? Sure. So thanks, Stephen, and thanks again for everyone for for attending and uh, being here. Um, as Stephen said, we really talked over the last two webinars about two different aspects of how to look at portfolio construction, portfolio risk, and the, and the results thereof. So how to use the compliant candidate portfolio set to see how your portfolio is and how it performed relative to what could have done. And then using the risk quality graph to look at your portfolio ex ante to see what sort of state it is in. Have you, how have you balanced the twin or the, the, the two sides of portfolio construction, expressing your view and managing your risk? Um, we kind of start from the point of view that if you just look, you take a historical performance of a portfolio, say, well, you know, this did okay, six and a bit percent. This is a, um, a benchmarked portfolio, so 630 bips over uh, is pretty good for a benchmarked uh, long only portfolio with a quite low tracking error and 2.5% uh, odd drawdown. But it doesn't really tell you the full story. The, the point of the candidate portfolios was to say, well, look, given your asset selections, given what, you, what assets you chose in the very first place and what the constraints are on your portfolio, and in this case it was you know, relative to benchmark how much you could have on each asset. There are some other constraints around sector and, and uh, such a sort of uh, biases, what could you have achieved? And the candidate portfolio approach shows you with a whole set of sample portfolios that were constructed from your selection with your constraints, what could you have done? And you can see that actually uh, in this, this particular case and in, in many cases, the spread of 
returns you could have experienced as a uh, an investor in this portfolio was of the same order of magnitude as the alpha you did experience. And the actual return you got was kind of around about the 50th percentile of possible returns, which isn't bad. It, it, it points to the idea that some thought had gone into making the portfolio, but it certainly can be improved upon. And uh, what we talked about in the first webinar was the way that using a, a, a correctly constructed, cleverly systematic approach can improve on that consistently. So in this case, the Sherpa portfolio, and, and this is data that we actually ran, you know, totally, we did this portfolio at the beginning of time, and this is real data. Um, our portfolio uh, got to about the 65th, 66th percentile, I think, or 67th uh, percentile, uh, and added an extra one or 200 basis points um, return to this PM. So there is a widespread of possible results from your choices and your constraints. Typically, we see managers getting around about the 50th percentile. Typically, we see a, a, a correctly constructed uh, systematic approach, such as the one we use, gets you to around about between 60th and 70th percentile. And that difference is genuine capturable p and um, Let me just move forward a bit. The second webinar, we looked at ex ante. If you look at a portfolio, how can you tell if you've done it well or not? Um, and to do that, we thought about the four drivers of what drives constructing a portfolio. You have to think about what is your view on any asset? What is the expectation of return of an asset? You have to think about how risky any particular asset is. And then you have to think about how that asset's risk, its downside, plays with the downside of the rest of the portfolio. And that's quite a complicated concept, and we went into that a little bit. Um, we call it co-movement. It's, it's not correlation. It's the particular balance of the rest of the portfolio with one particular asset, how those two things play together. And of course, if you change the weight of one asset, you change the way that everything co-moves. Um, and of course, you have to think about constraints, as we mentioned, um, sector per asset, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are all things you kind of know up front. If you can think about a way of looking at those, and this is what we showed you, the risk quality score graph, you can look at your portfolio and you can say, oh, actually, I have constructed my portfolio in a pretty good way. This graph, if you recall, the second webinar shows the weights of the assets on the y-axis, the risk quality score, how much you like an asset and how risky it is on the x-axis, and the size of the bubble being an indication of how much uh, co-movement any bubble and any particular asset has. Uh, and you can see that the ORS, the, the systematically constructed portfolio using the Sherpa methodology, in general, has uh, a smaller total size of bubbles, which means it's experiencing less negative co-movement. Um, and it has uh, the assets with smallest bubbles having the highest weight which is, of course, what you want. You want to give weight to assets which have negative co-movement or reduce the overall co-movement risk, the p &L, negative P&L you experience in the portfolio while still expressing your view as strongly as possible. That's the, uh, the conflict of portfolio construction. Stephen, no sound. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Okay, let me move on. Um, the result, if we if we go back our our portfolio, our comparison of the uh, the portfolio constructed by the PM versus our portfolio, how did they pan out over time? Well, you can see that the ORS portfolio, which is the blue line, significantly outperformed in PL and in drawdown and in volatility. Um, so there was, sorry, I, I'm just trying to get Stephen back online. Um, so the, the results, the ex ante view showed a better portfolio. The bubbles were smaller, the high bubble, the small bubbles were higher. And the ex post result set actually shows how that turns out in time. Um, the next stage of this is saying, okay, now we have these tools, we have compliant portfolio 
uh, candidates and we have um, a way of looking at portfolio, how can we combine these to decide how much risk we want up front? Um, properly constructed systematic portfolio techniques can help you decide this. And I, we want to show you this uh, in, in the rest of this uh, webinar. Um, this is a real data set, uh, like it says on the on the slide. Um, uh, it's an emerging markets uh, data set, um, quite concentrated but um, and quite constrained, uh, but global emerging market uh, data set uh, for long only fund. So this is what the candidate portfolios looked like ex post. Um, all the possible portfolios, and you end up with uh, you know, a, a decent upward sloping um, uh, PNL, but quite a wide variation. It, it's not as wide as the first set we looked at because this portfolio does have a lot more constraints on it. But even so, you can still have a, a, like I think it's a seven odd percent swing between the the, the best result and the, and the and the worst result for um, the for the investor. Um, and the risk quality score graph. Well, this is the same graph. For this particular um, of a sort of medium risk evolution of this. Now, I want to show you how things change, both in terms of the return stream and the risk quality score graph, as you go up and down in risk terms. Okay, um, the graph shows you that it's constructed reasonably well, but we haven't said yet how much risk we want to take, how much actual what, what is our decision on how risky we want to be how much confidence do we have in our views um, we can ascribe to this PL some sort of expectation of, of performance we can say the, the assets are scored four three two four for the ones with the highest alpha and two for the ones with the lowest expected um, return um, and you can say okay if, you know if the, given the weight of the assets that have a score of four and they're expected alpha, you could do a sum product and say, okay, this portfolio should return 15% if we are right. Okay, this is one way of, of looking at it. Um, with a given, now I've introduced this new thing here, um, risk number. Now, this isn't a, you know, a number you kind of can put in a, in a report, but it gives you an idea going from the lowest risk to the highest risk sort of possible within these constraints zero to 100, with a, a, a halfway measure, what is your expectation of alpha? Oh, Stephen's dropped off. Hopefully, he can come back on. But, um, but we, we still can't hear Stephen. <laughs> no. OK. Um, so I, I want to show you what happens as you move up and down in risk. Okay? So we, we've understood how to define what we want in a portfolio, maximum expectation of alpha with minimum downside, but of course these two things play against each other. And we want to show how those actually do play against each other. So um, clearly you go up in risk, you should have higher risk, and if you're right, you'll have higher return and vice versa. So this is where we really uh, get to the meat of, of this particular topic. Here's the, the picture of the ex-ante portfolio, the risk quality score on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, what did that turn out to be? And this is a portfolio constructed using a correct systematic approach, taking account of everything, trying to get the best balance and using, of course, the Sherpa approach. And this is around about medium risk. And I want to show you what happens as we go down in risk. Okay, so that's a medium risk of 50, sorry, wrong way, 50. As we go down in risk, I'm dialing the risk down here. That's 40, 30, 20, 10. Okay, let me go back up again. You can see, as we dial down the risk, the ex-ante view of the portfolio, you can see what's going on. More uh, larger bubbles are being pushed down, but of course you still have to make 100% weight. So you have to push up some of the smaller bubbles which have less conviction. So you're taking, as you dial down the risk, you're taking less convicted view, convicted? less view on your higher conviction assets because they have a tendency to add risk. Let's go back up through that again. So here's a medium risk. And as we drop down risk to the lowest possible risk in this set of constraints, we can see that we've got some of these 
we, we're making up weight with the smallest uh, bubbles that we can, and the larger bubbles, the ones that have more co-movement, are getting dropped because they add relatively more risk than they do expectation of return. Um, if we go all the way down to zero, this is the so the lowest possible uh, zero on our scale, the lowest possible risk we can take out of all our candidate portfolios. And let's go back up from zero back up to 100. And you can see, and I'm going to go back and forth a few times. And I'm slowly increasing risk. And what can we see? We can see the bubble graph. As we increase risk, we can see some bubbles with large uh, width, meaning they have high co-movement. They share downside with the rest of the portfolio. We see those gaining in asset weight going up the y-axis. Sorry. Um, and at the same time, we see the performance graph. Of course, we're getting a higher return, but we're also getting much bigger drawdowns. Our drawdown is increasing and our actually sharp is uh, beginning to decrease. So again, if, let's go through this starting at the lowest risk and looking at how as we increase our desired risk that we want to take in our portfolio, we can see our portfolio shape changing our ex ante view of the portfolio, which is the bubble graph on the left, and we can see the resulting P&L, the, the actual thing you will experience as an investor in the portfolio, changing as well. Yeah, the maximum risk, this is there is alpha in our asset selection, so we're getting the most return, but we're also increasing our, our experience of negativity, which is really uh, drawdown, uh, down, downside volatility. Um, decreasing the risk again. So this is our sort of you know, synthetic animation, right? Go up and down risk. You can see the bubble graph changing and the experience changing. Now, the point of this is that once you know your four drivers of a portfolio, you know, once you know what you want to own, what your convictions are on them, so your expectations of forward alpha, once you know the individual riskiness of the stock, uh, which gives you its position on the x-axis, its risk quality score. Once you know how that asset, that stock moves compared to everything else, and you can perform the multidimensional sophisticated calculation of how to at max or to get the right balance between the expression of alpha and uh, the amount of risk you want to take, and once you know what all your constraints are, you are in a position to choose where, so I'll go back here, from zero to 100, which one of these things you want to experience. You're in a position to choose ex ante. You have done your job as a portfolio manager. You've selected your assets. You've um, created a conviction score and a forward-looking expectation of return for each asset. You can provide the information about the assets, you know what the constraints are you're operating under, and you can use a tool such as this to say, actually, the, the experience I want to have is more like this, what, risk number 50, than this, your risk number of zero. Um, you're in that position to choose, and it, it becomes a much simpler operation you do the, the hard work of understanding your assets and your convictions. You do the hard work of understanding the product that you are selling, which is your investable portfolio, and the constraints that making it sellable entails. And then you use a system to create a nicely, systematically, correctly constructed portfolio, which takes the amount of risk that you want to take. And ex ante, you can see that you've done it because you can look at your bubble graph, and ex post, you will see that you have done it because you will see the return stream that you have experienced. Now, the reality of how this pushes through is when you look at um, the graph showing as we go up and down risk, how the expectation of return and the expectation of sharp changes. Uh, and this is quite interesting. Of course, as you go up risk, the expectation of return 
increases and the reality of return also increased we saw on, on our graph um, but the sharp clearly has a point of maximum sharp the the point where your your return is most relative to your volatility now we actually don't look at volatility we look at downside volatility or propensity to draw down um, but sharp is is probably more broadly understood um, what does this point mean this point of inflection well it's the point at which your alpha quality in which the uh, information contained in your asset selections is of the same magnitude where is is the is best expressed given all the constraints that you have um, uh, now it's not necessarily easy ex ante to know where that point is um, you can look historically at your performance uh, not necessarily the actual performance of your fund but the performance of your picks when put into a correctly constructed fund and back this out um, create these graphs and see where it is but but the point should not be uh, lost that there is a optimal point of risk for you to take, for you, for any manager to take, and it is linked to the quality of your asset selections. Clearly, if you are always 100% right, you should put, you know, bet the farm on 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 the asset that you're always 100% right on. Okay. If 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 you're that, you don't need us. Clearly, but the degree to which you are co correctly or consistently correct determines where on this graph uh, you want to, where, where the peak on this graph is. Uh, for this particular manager with this particular fund, it turns out to be around about 30, 35, I think, on the, on the risk number. Um, uh, you can see ex ante what that portfolio looks like. You can see where you've got large asset, or assets with larger weights and large um, co-movements. So here you've got sort of a mediumish weight asset, but clearly has large co-movement. Um, and you can go back and see, well, if you change that weight, what happens to everything else? And if you typically, what happens if you reduce its weight, other assets have to go up in weight to keep the uh, money invested at work. Um, and that changes the balance of all the co-movements and reduces the overall effectiveness of your portfolio construction. Um, you can see that you've got uh, your highest weight assets are not too bad in co-movement terms. The bubbles aren't too big. Well, this one is a little bit larger. You can go into it and look at it and say, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, I know what this bubble is. We can say it's this particular asset. Um, maybe I will tone down my conviction in a little bit, or maybe I will move it around. Uh, but the point of the, the bubble graph is it lets you see where you're well positioned uh, and, and lets you ask questions of your own uh, construction. Um, so what happens? What happened to this particular portfolio? Well, with the risk number of 35, risk number, the scale from zero to 100, around about 35, um, you get uh, – Around about, I think, what percentile? It's around about the 70th percentile of possible returns, um, which again is quite a big difference from what the PM typically experiences, which is around about the 50th percentile. And that's that is a realistic, um, achievable goal. Right, going from the 50th percentile of possible returns, which isn't bad, isn't good. It demonstrates that you know you've put some thought into portfolio construction, but not necessarily a great deal, uh, perhaps because the tools are lacking, it is perfectly feasible to go from the 50th to the 70th um, by using a, a systematic, uh, well-controlled, um, well-thought-out portfolio construction methodology that takes account of these four drivers. Um, it's clearly not achievable to aim for 100th percentile. Right? That just makes no sense. That implies a huge amount of, of that a priori knowledge of, of things that will happen in the future. And that's just never going to be the case. But it, again and again and again, we see that going from around about the 50th to around about the 70th percentile uh, of possible portfolio results is totally and completely achievable whilst maintaining integrity with your portfolio uh, constraints uh, and being able to choose the amount of risk you want to take to make yourself more investable, to make yourself 
uh, be able to tell your investors ex ante, look, this is what I'm going to do. This is how my portfolio is going to perform. So I think, I mean, I think we've still lost Stephen. Can uh, Yep, we've still lost Stephen. Uh, so um, uh, we kind of uh, draw to a close here of the, the formal part of the presentation. Clearly, Sherpa Tech, um, our business is in helping portfolio managers go from that 50th percentile to that 70th percentile. Um, it's realizable, it's achievable. We know how to do it. Uh, it involves, it's not a simple matter of pressing a button on a computer system. Uh, there's quite a lot of work going around it and that's gonna be the topic of the next webinar uh, where we talk about the workflow, the information flow, uh, and the way that we operate, uh, the way that we work, and the way that you can help yourselves be um, get from that 50th percentile to the 70th percentile. So with that, we've got a few minutes left. Um, there is a kind of chat function if anyone wants to ask any specific questions. Um, uh, but failing that or failing Stephen's um, technical I, I shall then then I shall speak for Stephen uh, and say thank you all very much indeed for attending. Thank you, Stephen, for setting it all up. Um, please do remember we've this webinar is uh, recorded. There's a you can access the recording, share it with your colleagues, and if you want to get in touch with us, um, details are on the slide, uh, email, phone, whatever and whatever. But um, I think I probably draw that to a conclusion, say again, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at webinar number four, remember, which is gonna be around organizing the workflow to maximize your chance of success. Stephen is pointing, trying to tell me something. I can't hear him, but I'll say thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.